The Yukon Huskies rolled to a 20-point victory over Indiana to tip off the Empire Classic. Is Danny Hurley's team already in championship form? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Happy Monday. Happy Feast Week here on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, five times per week, national college hoop show, part, of course, of the Locked On Podcast Network. We are your co-hosts. I'm Andy Patton. He is Isaac Shade. Today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you all by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Folks, it is the most exciting week in college basketball that does not happen in the month of March. Feast week, college basketball's big breakout celebration, some tremendous games. We've talked at length on this show about the loaded Maui Invitational Field that is going to get uh, tipped off. While many of you are listening to this, most likely, I think it's 2.30 Eastern time that that first game between Tennessee and Syracuse gets started. We got Battle for Atlantis coming up soon. We got some tremendous college basketball. As of right now, for those of you who have been keeping track with our undefeated watch, we have 63 undefeated teams as we're recording this right now. There is at least one more guaranteed uh, loss that'll take place this evening. Uh, a couple a couple others as well. We're recording this right now between the St. John's wow. Utah game. It's 66-60 as we're talking right now. We also got Xavier St. Mary's, Dayton and Houston, Washington and San Diego State. Lots of good basketball still to be played here on Sunday evening. But Isaac, I want to talk about the Empire Classic. Yes. And I wasn't sure that we were going to spend a lot of time on the Empire Classic. You had four really iconic brands, iconic programs, (laughs) UConn versus Indiana. You had Texas versus Louisville. And the results have been interesting. UConn blasted Indiana, 20-point victory there, tremendous stuff from Tristan Newton. They didn't have Stefan Castle, and they still looked outstanding. Meanwhile... Meanwhile, Kenny Payne and the Cardinals almost pulled off an absolute stunner. Texas managed to survive thanks to a miraculous shot from Max A. Smith. I want to talk about both these games, all four of these teams, what we've seen so far. I want to throw it to you first and kind of what, out of these two games, what was your kind of big takeaway or surprise or intrigue that happened in these, uh, these two games in the Empire Classic? Well, Andy, I have, uh, you know, of my final four picks, I feel real good about Creighton. I feel real good about Tennessee. I'm a little concerned about Texas. Uh, yeah. That's that's the yeah. thing here is I, I, I want to start with that nightcap game because um, the, it's so funny. The, literally the first thing I saw from somebody after the game is somebody texted me, is Louisville back? Come on, man. No, no. Louisville is no. not. Back. Far However, away from it. <laughs> not even remotely is Louisville back. And I think that speaks to the height of what Louisville should be, right? But um, this does suggest this outcome to me that they're not going, at least not going to be as miserably terrible as they were last season. But um, so a good showing for them. I don't think it's ultimately going to save Kenny Payne's job unless just they take off. But uh, Max Asmus saves Texas from a complete embarrassment here because you just cannot lose to Louisville in this. However, Andy, here's the big takeaway for me with this for Texas. Yes, they pulled it out. And at the end of the day, the win-loss record is ultimately what matters, right? Like that that's what we're looking at. But whether or not that near buzzer beater shot from Max A. Smith goes down or not, this has to be in v- viewed as an indictment of Texas at some level, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, it's not like Louisville made some miraculous run. They were in this game the entire time. I was keeping track of it. I was like, When's mm-hmm. Louisville's last lead? Because I wanted to be able to talk about it, but I just kept extending it. Their last lead was one second on the clock, right? Yep. And so, Andy, I, I think that's the thing for me is that, sure, Louisville might be a little better, but mm-hmm. and, and I know a one-game sample size doesn't tell us much, but yep. it does give me a lot of pause about Texas. I think there's a there's a couple of clear things here. One, Louisville is a more talented team than they were last year, just yeah. on paper. We yeah. knew that. Scott Clark, Clark, he's yeah. very up and down, but he is talented when he's on, and he played great in this game. Dennis Evans hasn't quite been that guy yet, but he's a top prospect for a reason. I think he's going to put together some good stuff with them. Trey White is solid as well. And so I think Louisville is a better team. 
I also think Texas has some serious depth concerns. Now, they're missing Dylan DeSue in this game. They've missed him all year. That's certainly a, a factor for them at this point. But you look at the bench scoring here. Ithiel Horton was okay in this game, but he Ten. has kind of been their only depth piece that has really stepped up for them yet. Shendall Weaver was a, a transfer I was very excited about coming over from UT Arlington. He was the WAC freshman of the year, and he, he didn't hurt them in this game. He didn't have any turnovers, only missed two shots, but he also only scored two points. And you're just not getting a lot from some of those depth pieces that Rodney Terry brought in. And it's early. They're missing a key piece. Caden Shedrick looked unbelievable in this game. So there's still a lot of upside for I think it's that a uh, shoulder thing, man. He just looks like yeah. Robocop out there. Yeah. <laughs> he does. He does. Yeah. So I'm not like panicking on texas no, there's no, very no. few teams that i'd be panicking about right now but yeah if i pick them in the final four i could see being like well they, you, you can clearly see there's things that need to happen between now and then they totally could rodney terry's a good coach getting yeah. to sue back will help but they're they're not there yet and, and they avoided what would have been a, a really catastrophic i mean a loss that could have frankly cost them a seed line in march and i think what the point you just made about dylan to sue is massive because we, we say often in college basketball, you really need eight dudes. Mm -hmm. And when DeSue is back in this lineup, it probably bumps Cunningham out, I would imagine, mm -hmm. is the one that's the odd man out. And so that fills your bench up a little more with Weaver mm -hmm. and Horton and Cunningham. Yep. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's going to give Texas enough depth to do what they got to do. But um, yeah, need more. Caden Shedrick, what a game. Yeah, from him. And uh, that's interesting. Andy, let's go to the other game, though, because you, you talked about it in the cold open. My goodness, I was uh, apparently shouldn't have been, but I was concerned. What is <laughs> UConn going to do without Stefan Castle? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I should not have been. So, Andy, mm -hmm. it's that requisite question we always ask. Mm -hmm. Is this 24 point stomping mm -hmm. more about UConn's readiness or like, hey, Indiana, where are you at? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard because it's definitely both. It's definitely both. I, I think clearly for me, UConn didn't look perfect. I mean, Castle, no Castle meant Solomon Ball stepped into a bigger role. He looked very good. He didn't shoot it super well, but I thought he, he fit what they needed him to do. But the bench only scored seven points for UConn in this game. And so I think I like in depth, yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, obviously ball stepping into the starting lineup hurts their bench depth, but like last year's team had Joey Calcaterra coming off the bench. Like they had Naheem Aline coming off the bench. Neither of those guys are there. Hang on. Anymore. And some dude named Donovan Klingon coming off. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even mention Klingon. Yeah. Klingon coming <laughs> off the bench last year too. And I think like this team is top heavy, really talented. Tristan Newton, Alex Caravan, Donovan Klingon, like I spent when Castle's healthy, like this team is phenomenal at the top. Cam Spencer didn't even mention him. He looked fantastic too, but uh, they there is some concern about the depth. Not enough for me to not think they're still going to be a elite eight final four. I mean, potential repeat champion. They literally are still in that conversation. And once they get Castle back, that depth uh, becomes a bit more of a strength. But I think that this game also said just showed us that Indiana is not there. They're just not there yet. I, you know, I, I think they might get there. Uh, they were talking on the broadcast about how Indiana didn't go after a lot of older transfers. They kind of went after some of the younger players available in the Porter, like uh, like Kalel Ware, who obviously he's been a huge part of their season so far, but this was his one of his first real chances to have a great game against a quality opponent, and he kind of fell on his face. Yeah. Uh, two of 10 shooting in this game. O of six on two pointers literally did not convert from inside the arc in this one. 11 points, eight boards. And Malik Renault looked fine. And I think that this team has the pieces. But if Ware's not going to be there every single night, if McKenzie and Baco is going to continue to not really be there, oh, like dude. this he, team, this team's going to struggle. McKenzie and Baco, four games, four points, two points, 13 points. And another, was it two or four in this one? Another two. So yeah. four, two, 13, two. Mm -hmm. They need more from that dude. He's yeah. too talented. I, I mean, that's just for me where, where it's at. Like I, I need to see more from Mbako. Where can't do that. Andy, mm -hmm. back on the, on the UConn side of things. Is it for you an impressive thing that UConn did this with Donovan Klingon only taking three field goals and only scoring seven points? Or is it more of a concern that he's not doing more, right? Like, because the majority of the scoring here is coming from Caravan and Tr Tristan Newton and Cam Spencer. Do you, is it like? Does that make sense? One of those where it's like, wow, UConn won by twenty, and we only got seven from Donovan Klingon, or it's like, Klingon, where? What are you doing? Yeah, I think it's more the first one, and and I, 
the, this comparison doesn't work in a lot of ways. So I want to be clear that I'm, I'm mostly making this comparison for one specific reason. Uh, it's kind of like what Chet Holmgren looked like at Gonzaga in the sense that Chet didn't dominate games offensively very often because they had Drew Timmy. And so Chet deferred to Drew Timmy, who scored 20 points per game. And so Chet would have a lot of games where he'd have 11 points on three of five shooting. He'd also have eight rebounds, four blocks, and you know wouldn't have missed a single shot or maybe only missed one shot. And it's like, if you watch the game, you were like, yeah, he looked great. He just didn't, you know, he just wasn't constantly getting the ball in his hands didn't have the super high usage rate and i think that's kind of how Klingon's going to operate yeah. Yeah. Uh, with yukon of like maybe Doesn't he's a little it. bit quieter maybe he only takes four or five shots but unless unless he's missing a bunch of shots like shooting sub 40 percent which seems very unlikely or yukon is losing games and he's just a non-factor unless those things are happening i think this is just smoothly operating the way danny hurley wants it to yep and and outside of this and i know it's lesser competition but he's had 12 points on four of eight, 16 points on eight of 15 and 17 mm -hmm. points on seven of eight. So yeah. I'm with you. I think this is an outlier and uh, ultimately a good thing for UConn. Now, Andy, you and I are not money managers. People should not come to us for any kind of stock advice. That would be silly of them. But you want to know with basketball teams, who stock up and who stock down and who you should hold on? Buy, sell, what's it looking like? Oh, you know we can bring that advice for you. And we'll do that right after I tell you about our brand new sponsor on the Locked On Network, listening.com. Now, folks, in addition to Locked On, you might or might not know that I'm actually also a college professor. And I got to tell you, when I first heard that listening.com was going to be one of our new sponsors, I got super excited about it because I want to give my students at school a, trans, a chance to try out listening.com. I'm stoked for this opportunity. I can't wait to get back from Thanksgiving break and tell them all about it because I get the whole week off, baby. What up? <laughs> so college students, listen up. There's this incredible app called listening.com, which can take any academic paper, PDF, or class material and turn it into an audio book. It can read math equations, technical words, complicated documents, you name it, it can do it. It can. It's smart enough to like skip footnotes and citations and lets you jump exactly to where you need to get in the material. It even has one-click note-taking button where it automatically puts um, the last 10 seconds into a notepad so you don't have to type notes while you listen. Best of all, usually with listening.com, you get two free weeks free, but if you use the link listening.com slash locked on, you'll be able to get a third straight week free to open up your trial. So go ahead, give it a try. Get an extra week free when you go to listening.com slash locked on. Listening.com, help make your learning more efficient. Andy, I made up that tagline myself. I kind of like it. What do you think? I like it. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, come on now. Maybe I should be in advertising. Just call me <laughs> Dom Draper. All right, folks. Uh, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. It's going on all the time right now. Our show is daily at 2 p.m. Eastern time on there. You can go check it out. Would love for you to come be part of it. It's a, such a rad idea, and we're the first ones to do it here at the Locked On Network. Andy, stock up, stock down, and we'll give some honorable mentions as well. Let's start with the, the sad side of it so we can get happy as we build. <laughs> stock down. Andy, we got a couple teams here uh, that we're going to talk about, and then one honorable mention. Why don't you get us into it? Yeah, I got to start with FAU. Uh, the Owls, Florida Atlantic, of course. Uh, preseason darling because of that final four run last year, top 10 in the AP poll uh, throughout the season so far. A lot of people were kind of unsure what, how, how we should feel about this team. Again, they returned everybody from last year's roster effectively, bring back coach Dusty May. Uh, they take a loss to Bryant, a pretty unexpected loss, quite honestly, not just because you know they were a ranked team losing to a mid-major team, but Bryant hadn't looked very good to start the season. They were 216th at Ken Palm. FAU was 25th at the time uh, of the game. They have dro now dropped down to 47. It was a 61-52 loss, and FAU's offense just straight up wasn't there. They just they they were missing shots they normally make. They they didn't look like the the inferior team by any stretch. They just we're not knocking down shots that they normally knock down. And uh, it, it's unfortunate schools like FAU, when they lose games like this, they're going to immediately fall out and it's much harder to get back in to the top 25. We'll talk about another team that lost to a mid-major team in Arkansas here shortly. And Arkansas's path to, to be back in the top 25 or frankly, maybe not even drop out of the top 25 is far more significant. Whereas a school like FAU, that's not the case. And while that is a bummer, 
it's also worth acknowledging that most of the time FAU losing to a school like Bryant wouldn't be news at all. It would not be discussed on this podcast. We try to get to as many games, as many teams as possible, but if FAU didn't make a Final Four run last year, wasn't a top 10 team, we're probably not talking about them losing to a team like Bryant. So I think that it's it's cool that they have this extra exposure, that there's a bit more of a microscope on them, but at the same time, mid-major teams losing a game like this, it kind of fuels a lot of people who who maybe were had already decided that they didn't think FAU deserved to be here, and now they feel like they have more ammunition to have that kind of take. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is a home loss too, Andy. That that's yeah, kind of that's true. part of it. Like, and Bryant themselves shot terribly in this game. 34% mm-hmm. from the field, 27% yeah. from three. But FAU was even worse. Mm-hmm. They shot worse from the field than Bryant did from three. Andy, that's <laughs> difficult. 26.2 from the yeah. field and 16.7 from three. It's not going to win you many games. But as you said, I love it. I love this fact that it's mm-hmm. like, hey, FAU, good on you. We're still talking about you. And that's a win. I think I'm, I'm curious. I haven't finished my rankings yet. I'm curious to see if I keep them in or yeah. not. We'll have to look at that. Andy, another team we're stuck down on is Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, on Friday, uh, there's another home loss right there in Bud Walton, 78 yeah. to 72 to UNC Greensboro. Um, and for Arkansas, they dropped from 15 to 30th at Ken Palm. UNCG was 99 at the time. Same thing, kind of shooting uh, in the teens from mm-hmm. three for Arkansas. You can't do that, especially when you're playing with, you know, 58 guards on the floor at one time. Um, yeah. you got to be able to do better than that. And, Andy, here, here's the biggest takeaway for me. You know, for some reason, when we talked about uh, – you, you mentioned Arkansas preseason being overrated. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people that came for us and you in particular – for some reason, they haven't been able to find you since then to tell you <laughs> how thankful they are to you for being correct about that. It's I don't did they miss did they forget Weird, right? that it happened? Maybe I, I I'm just not sure. Maybe they don't know how to find us on social media. And it's just it's just disappointment from the Hogs fans. I was thinking they'd give you your flowers after this. <laughs> I was not. <laughs> um, here's the thing on Arkansas though, Isaac. Like I I. They're really reliant on Trevin Brazil, and he's really good. But I, I've always been worried about the front court. That was the concern when I had them a little when I had them overrated earlier in the season, yeah. uh, and that that's remains the concern. They have so many guards. They have so many talented guards. You don't quite know which one's going to step up and drop twenty on a given night, and, and that can be really good for Eric Musselman's team, but it also can be frustrating and problematic to try to figure out like is anybody going to show up today? But at the end of the day, they need more from the front court, and that's not. Uh, knock on Brazil. He wasn't great in this game, but he's not the sole reason they lost. But if they're not getting more from players that are over six foot six, if Brazil's the only one at that size who's really given him much, I think that's going to be a problem for them down the stretch. I don't think they're going to lose more of these Greensboro games all that often. Uh, But, you know, when you get into the SEC, when you get into uh, even the NCAA tournament and you're playing bigger teams, like I know they beat Purdue in that exhibition game, but I'm worried about their ability to to handle some of the size and front courts that they're going to end up seeing uh, with with what they have right now. And this is what we were trying to tell Hogs fans. Exhibition games don't count. <laughs> Regular season games do. Yeah. That's what we're talking about, and that's what we got to be aware of. Andy, one, one honorable mention mm-hmm. uh, stock down and uh, is, is St. John's, right? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of ironic because as we're talking, in the TV behind me is showing St. John's up on Utah 75 yeah. to 67 with 6.58 to go to timestamp this thing. But mm-hmm. Andy, it doesn't matter given what St. John's has done or frankly not done yeah. earlier this week. And so I, I think maybe we've all been a little too early to the St. John's bus and we need to we need to pump the brakes. St. John's down a little bit and uh, that's good. Andy, let's flip to some mm-hmm. happier times. Stock up. Listen, uh, let's start in Starkville, Mississippi, Andy. And the reason is because I think we were really excited about Mississippi State coming into the year, but then the Tolu Smith injury news, I think maybe had tempered our excitement. Would you yeah. say that's fair? Yeah, hundred percent. I, I kind of, I, they, they fell off my radar a little bit when I heard Tolu Smith was going to be hurt. And I was like, ah, oh, there's like, there's a bunch of teams in the middle of the right. SEC. They're going to yeah. be somewhere in that range, maybe an NCAA tournament team. And they've looked much better than that. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, that's a bummer. But here we sit Sunday yeah. after they beat, uh, a good Northwestern team, pretty mm-hmm. handily. They are now five and zero oh with wins, uh, you know, over all sorts of folks. And so mm-hmm. um, they seventeenth at Ken Palm again yeah. have done all this without Tolu Smith. Josh Hubbard had twenty nine on Sunday against Northwestern. So mm-hmm. uh, that the SEC that we already felt really good about, 
man, if Mississippi State's going to be doing this, that SEC is just going to be even better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, you look at a lot of the teams that are 4-0, and that are 5-0, and that have kind of climbed up the Ken Palm rankings that are kind of starting to get into that vote consideration. We'll talk about a few of them. They have played maybe one good team, maybe two, uh, but Mississippi State's played three Power 5 programs. Not great Power 5 programs, Washington State, Arizona State, and Northwestern, like but they're maybe, all top 100, you know, it's like maybe one tournament team out of there, maybe two, I suppose, but they've, they've beat them just handily. One. Just, one, just one, only Northwestern. Yeah, pro- probably. Um, their third at Ken Palm adjusted defensively. Like they've done it all without Tolu Smith. Like it's hard to not be excited about what Mississippi state has done up to this point. And we'll see if it sticks, but uh, yeah, they, they're a team that absolutely deserves to be, they're going to be my top 25 unquestionably uh, this, this week. And it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of times you look at it as like, all right, this is a good thing because they're building depth to get Tulu Smith mm-hmm. back and then they're even better. Too quickly, two mm-hmm. honorable mentions, stock ups, Clemson, mm-hmm. a really nice win over Boise State. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then BYU also, you know, right up there uh, along with Iowa State. No, we didn't even get to Iowa State. Mm-hmm. And stock up on Iowa State too. We got to keep moving, right? Yep. And uh, But uh, we're, we're stock up on those two Big 12 teams, Iowa State and BYU mm-hmm. with their which are both top 15 at Ken Palm right now, really helping out the Big 12 there, and yeah. then Clemson as well. A- anything you want to say on Iowa State? Because I know we plan to talk about them more in depth. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd say about them is we just need to see them do it against uh, a better competition. They're 4-0. Their closest game is literally a 31-point victory, which is incredible. Shout out to Iowa State for doing that, but they haven't played anybody ranked inside the top 285 at Ken Palm. Uh, They got VCU next. They got DePaul after that. They got Iowa after that. All those teams are top 175 teams. Uh, They should beat all three of them. If if they do, and they're 7-0 with those victories, I think we're going to have an even bigger conversation about this Cyclone squad. Well, and then after that, they got four more games that are all teams 283 or lower at Ken Palm. So (laughs) I think Iowa is the only game that's going to tell us anything until like their non-con schedule is terrible, Andy. I hadn't even looked at it. I'm looking at it right now. So Big 12 play. And that lone Iowa game is going to tell us uh, about the Cyclones. Well, Isaac, as we do every single Monday, we're going to run, run run you all through a six-pack of notable results, games, various other things going on in the college basketball landscape as we get into Feast Week. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, FanDuel. Folks, you can score early and often this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time than right before Feast Week to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, money line, player props, over-unders, and more. And if you get in on this early enough, you can make bets on the Maui Invitational right now. The odds at FanDuel as we're recording this, Kansas 175 to win the Maui Invitational. Tennessee is next at 320, despite not being ranked as high as Purdue, who comes in right behind them at 340 odds. Marquette's at plus 500. Gonzaga is at plus 950. UCLA at plus 2000. Syracuse at plus 5000. And Chaminade did not get any odds listed. I'm not super surprised by that news. So folks, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get in on the action this college basketball season. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right, Isaac, six pack here, getting through some other results over the weekend that we saw that we didn't quite get to in those first two segments. Want to start with that Miami versus Kansas State game on Sunday afternoon. Miami won. It was it the result ended up being an eight-point victory for the Canes, 91 to 83. It looked like much more of a blowout throughout most of the game. Miami was up by over or just under 20 points at halftime. Nigel Pack, Norchad O'Meara, and Wooga Poplar had 41 of Miami's 47 points. In in the first half, Kansas State made a really nice push down the stretch. I'm still got some optimism about Jerome Tang's team, yeah. uh, but this Miami team, which has been a bit hard to read, the computers don't love Miami. They got them 40th at Ken Palm right now. Uh, the the poll voters love Miami. They got them 12th. I think we're probably more leaning towards where the poll voters have them. I'm going to have them in my top 20 for sure, maybe top 15 for the Canes, but uh, a team that looks like they're going to run it back again under Coach L. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see once we get the AP poll out on Monday and then once Ken Palm ref- or uh, you know, mm-hmm. totally updated at the end of the night Sunday. Sure. Andy, 
How about uh, another ACC team against an SEC team? This game was incredible. LSU and Wake Forest. LSU wins 86 to 80 in overtime. This is a game that Wake Forest never led until yeah. OT, but uh, just they they took an early lead in OT and then LSU handled it the rest of the way. Honestly, LSU let the Demon Deacons back in this game by yeah. going three of eight from the free throw line in the final two minutes. Uh, that is not going to cut it, Andy Patton. You need to know mm-hmm. that. Um, with the Wake Forest, you know, they've, we've talked so much about how they've just had this great stretch of transfer guards coming in. Mm-hmm. Hunter Salas is the latest in that. He had 22 points in this game and was so good. But here's the problem for Wake, Andy. The ball was not enough in his hands down the stretch. In fact, in the final 1330 of the game, and I mean the five minutes of OT and the final 830 of regulation, had just one basket, and that's yeah. not because he was missing a bunch of them. It's because other dudes mm-hmm. were taking shots. you got to recognize your best player and get him the ball. Uh, Cam Hildreth, Andy, almost had an epic blunder uh, at the end of regulation. Wake had kind of miraculously tied it up, and then he still committed a foul. You don't foul anymore once you're tied, but thankfully for him, LSU had just called a timeout right before mm-hmm. he fouled. Crazy stuff. But uh, LSU does prevail in OT. Another big win for the SEC. You mentioned uh, SEC versus ACC games. Let's run it back with one more here. Florida. This this game was all the way back on Friday night. We didn't get a chance to talk about it on Friday's show. But Florida blitzed Florida State. Absolutely blasted them. 89-68. to Todd Golden gets a big signature win against a rivalry there. Big win for the SEC as well. Uh, Walter Clayton. We've been talking about him on the show. We've been talking about how he needs to step up. Iona transfer hasn't quite filled that role yet for Florida. They need somebody outside of Riley Kugel to really do some damage. And and Walter Clayton was that guy. 19 points, five assists, two steals in this game for the Gators. Todd Golden is a guard whisperer. If Clayton and Kugel can be the two players that we know they're capable of being, this Florida team is, is certainly one to keep a close eye on in the SEC. And as we've been talking about bench play, the Gators got 29 Bench yeah. points, including uh, 15 from Zion Poole, and he loved to see that. Andy, SEC again, but this time it's SEC on Big East, mm-hmm. and it's Providence beating Georgia 71 to 64. Andy, Providence could be a team that's getting a little uh, stock up themselves here. Mm-hmm. The Friars are now four and one, with uh, the the lone loss being an OT loss to K State earlier in the weekend. It's a great start for Kim English. There in Providence, 19 from Devin Carter and Josh Aduro in this win over. Uh, it's funny, we go from talking about Florida to Georgia over Mike mm-hmm. White's Bulldogs there. Um, now, for Providence, only played seven dudes, mm-hmm. and uh, the bench, you know, going back to bench depth, not contributing, only yeah. seven points. So we'll have to keep an eye on that bench depth for the Friars. I- I'm curious to see. I'm going to look while you're talking about their bench usage uh, ratings on Ken Palm. Yeah, next game here, uh, speaking of teams to stock up, stock down, both these teams are probably, frankly, in the stock stock down category right now, but Villanova did secure themselves a victory over a, a tremendously struggling Maryland team Oof. in the Big Ten. This game was also on Fridays. 57-40 to 40 was the final score here. Two teams that have struggled to put the ball in the hoop all season long. They met against each other and just continued to struggle to put the ball in the hoop. 43 combined points in the second half. It was 39-15. to 15 at halftime just an ugly ugly game tyler burton had 15 for the cats but man this is a tough one maryland has not looked like a team that they haven't even come close to the preseason expectations that people had for them uh, villanova we'll see if they can right the ship they got a good opportunity to do so at the battle for atlantis coming up this week uh you know kind of similar to north carolina a chance to, to maybe kind of exercise some demons from last year's phil knight invitational where both those teams did not do so well uh, this is a great opportunity for Villanova coming off a, a nice win here, but didn't exactly answer a lot of the questions we still have about Cotton Neptune squad. This week will teach us a lot for sure. Andy, we <laughs> talked about Clemson earlier, and that's the final part of today's six pack. They absolutely blasted Boise State 85 to 68 on Sunday. It was funny. You mentioned, I say absolutely blasted. You mentioned uh, mm-hmm. that uh, this game was close. You're watching it, you look up and it's like, holy, Clemson went yep. on a run. And that's what they're going to be able to do. We t- Joe Girard. Chase Hunter, Mm -hmm. P.J. Hall, that's a great trio there. Joe Girard had 23 points, Mm -hmm. 17 in the second half from the Syracuse transfer. Uh, But that trio, 51 of Clemson's 85 on Sunday. And and Clemson's 4-0, and it's all over mid-majors. And Mm -hmm. Andy, those who aren't paying attention might look at that and be like, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same as like Iowa State. These wins are much better. Davidson, UAB, Boise State, Winthrop. 
Those are very strong, all top 150 level um, mm-hmm. teams. And so I'm much more impressed with Clemson's resume right now than Iowa State's. They are shooting 37.8% from three as a team are the Tigers. I've got them as a top five ACC team right now. Should make a lot of noise for Brad Brown now. All right, folks, that's it today. Six pack tomorrow. Andy and I will be back with you. And oh boy, there will be Maui to talk about. And we just cannot wait. We want to thank you for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen every single day. By the way, update for you. St. John's is about to knock off Utah. 90 seconds left. Johnny's are up 89.75. We're still stocked down though, Andy, aren't we? Yes, we absolutely are. (laughs) Uh, By the way, again, come join our Discord. The link is in the show notes. We'd love to chat with you all feast week long uh, while we pull away from the turkey a little bit. (laughs) Please don't forget to subscribe to the show on video and audio. Smash the like button if you're watching so we know you're here. And we'd love to hear your comments, who you're stock up and stock down on as well. As always, apologies to the lawyer family. Let's go Wildcats. Let's get Andy out of here so we can go to the Thunder basketball game. And until tomorrow... (laughs) Peace.